This is the grave of Henry Michael Ferris. Michael to his family and Mike to his friends in Triple One Squadron. He was an ace and a veteran of the Battle of France and the Battle of Britain. But on the 16th of August 1940, at the age of just 22, disaster happened. Whether or not it was intentional or pure accident is what we're going to be looking at in this video. So I shot that footage several months ago and since then I've had the opportunity to really research Henry Michael Ferris and find out a lot about him and I'm really glad that I did. So why should we care about this guy that probably none of us have heard of before and I certainly hadn't heard of before I stumbled across his grave in that churchyard? Well, first of all, I would just say he was a remarkable young man and had it not been for some crazy Austrian corporal flexing his muscles, I think Henry Michael Ferris would have made a massive impact on British society. I truly believe that he would have cured some sort of medical um, issue that we had, some disease, and really benefited the world as a whole. In the context of this channel, Military Aviation, I would say that at the time of his death, he was one of the top scoring fighter pilots in the RAF, um, certainly in the top 10. Um, I don't have the exact numbers because I'm in the middle of a massive project where I'm uh, transcribing all the victory claims of the RAF and then I'm going to compare them against the Luftwaffe losses in a massive database um, just so I have access to that. And it's taken me months and it will take me more months and pro possibly years to get through that. So I can tell you that he's definitely in the top 10 um, at the time. The other thing that struck me during my research and the reason why I think Henry Michael Ferris is quite important to make a video about is his role in number 11 squadron and how as a unit they started to really question the established approach to fighter attacks. And you can clearly see how they evolved and started making ex experiments with how they were intercepting the Germans and conducting themselves. And ultimately, it was one of these experiments that led to his death. So, who was Henry Michael Ferris? Henry Michael Ferris was born in Lewisham, South London, on the 27th of September 1918. And at the outbreak of hostilities, he was living in Alpington with his mum and dad, Henry and Violet Ferris. To the family, he was always Michael on the account of his Irish father having the same name, Henry. So I just want to interrupt the video quickly here. Um, I actually know the exact address where Henry Michael Ferris lived in 1939, officially with his parents. And I asked you guys, would it be weird if me as a YouTuber sent like a picture and a short bio to the new ha homeowners of this, uh, this house? Obviously, someone's just bought it recently. Um, and 85% of you said, no, that wouldn't be weird, Phil. So that's what I did. He went to school at St Joseph's at Blackheath and later the Roman Catholic Stonyhurst College in Lancaster, which is probably why he sounds less like me and more like this. When we got to the scene, there were 24 Dorniers altogether in three bunches. The first bunch had already dropped their bombs and the second lot was about to go in. Ferris must have been a gifted student because he was already attending the University of London by September 1935 when he joined the newly formed University Air Squadron. The young Michael then became a medical student at St Thomas's, following in his pharmacist's father's footsteps before finally joining the RAF in July 1937. This would have made Ferris just 18 years and 9 months give a few days, when he accepted a short service commission and was made an acting pilot officer. It's been suggested he dropped out of medical school due to a lack of funds. I'd suggest that as an only child to a middle class family, it's more likely he got bitten by the flying bug. Upon joining the RAF, he was posted to 6 FTS, Netheravon, on the 18th of September and joined number 111 squadron at Northolt on the 7th of May 1938. Two days later, the station was visited by King George VI. It was only in January of that year that number 111 squadron had been fully equipped with hurricanes. This meant that he would have been one of the first of the few to get his hands on the new monoplane fighter. However, he was not to fly one before the first hurricane casualty was suffered by fighter command. In February of that year, Flying Officer M.S. Bocquet was piloting a hurricane that dived into the ground after participating in a gas attack exercise at Uxbridge. The first operational loss would come just over two years later. 
One of the most notable events during this period was squadron leader Gillen completing a flight from Edinburgh to Northolt, some 327 miles, in just 48 minutes, giving him an average ground speed of 408 miles per hour. For a previously Gloucester Gauntlet equipped squadron, this must have been an exciting period to be part of, especially as a 18 year old. Over the next few months and years, 111 Squadron saw various upgrades in their frontline fighter, as well as several different postings. By the time Flight Lieutenant Michael Ferris took off on the 16th of August 1940, he would have had in excess of two years' experience flying the Hurricane. Triple One Squadron's war began with the same excitement and bewilderment of many fighter command units. There certainly was little boredom for these blokes in that winter of 1939 or over the following spring. The squadron fired their first rounds in anger over the capital, but not at enemy aircraft, but rather at stray balloons. Around 15 barrage balloons broke away from their moorings between the 20th of September and 4th of October 1939, all shot down by a number 111 squadron. Pilot Officer Ferris, flying in L-1720, shot one down from 12,000 feet, pouring 1,562 rounds into it. Evidently, this was one of the best aerial gunnery exercises the squadron could have hoped to have. Let's not forget that many entering the battle in the summer of 1940 had yet to fire their guns in the air at a real target. A few weeks later, on the 24th of October 1939, Ferris flew his first official wartime patrol from Northolt, a short 30-minute affair, but the first of an eventual 126 operational sorties. These 129 hours and 40 minutes of war flying, yes, I actually counted, would be augmented by nearly as many non-operational hours spent on training, air testing and transit to forward bases. On the 27th of October, having been based at Northolt since August 1934, number 111 was sent north to Acklington in Northumberland. The squadron carried out a schedule of both training and operational flights over the area, which led to the first official victory of the war for the unit. On the 29th of November 1939, squadron leader Harry Broadhurst was dispatched to intercept an intruder in poor weather. By sheer luck, he managed to locate and destroy a Heinkel 111 off the coast. It would not be the last claim for the squadron over the coming months. On the 7th of December, the squadron moved further north to Drem, to the east of Edinburgh, for what was recorded in the operational record book as a week's detachment. They remained there until the end of February. During this time, the King paid another visit to Triple One Squadron. Flying out of their new base, another encounter with the enemy was had on the 30th of January 1940, when Blue Section also met and attacked another Heinkel 111, but with inconclusive results. Despite their northerly posting, the enemy was getting closer and closer. Wick was the next posting of the squadron, where Ferris remained until moving south again in May 1940. It was during his stay at the far edge of Scotland that he encountered his first enemy aircraft. An unconfirmed claim for a Heinkel 111 was made on the 8th of April 1940, during a raid on Scarpa Flow by an estimated 25 enemy aircraft. Two days later, flying as part of Green Section, Pilot Officer Ferris claimed another Heinkel shot down near the naval base. As the day progressed, a further 40 German aircraft would carry out an ineffectual attack on Scarpa Flow. But Britain and her allies would soon find out the Germans weren't mucking about. Three days later, the Wehrmacht launched their invasion of France and the Low Countries. Number 111 returned to Northolm and was in action over France by the 17th of May. Rather than being posted directly to France herself, Number 111 would spend the best part of the next two months commuting to the war each morning before retreating to the UK in the evening. Then, as the Wehrmacht advanced, spending hours on long patrols over the front. A and B flight were often mixed with other units to make composite squadrons, or operated as individual units from French or British bases. It was during their second day of operations in the Battle of France that Number 111 experienced their first war casualty. During this period, A and B flights, sometimes flying together, were committed to a gruelling schedule of operational flying. Before dawn, the pilots would take off from Northolt and head to other British bases closer to the combat zone, namely Kenley, Manston or Hawkinge. 
From there, they would refuel their tanks and fly over French soil to carry out an offensive patrol. Landing to refuel on Allied bases in France, these patrols would continue throughout the day before the Hurricanes returned to the UK at or after dusk. It was while taking off from Vitry Airfield on the 18th of May 1940 that B Flight was attacked by 14 ME 109s. The results were both confusing and deadly. Flight Lieutenant Darwood, who had joined number 111 in 1936, was killed outright. In the operational record book, his death is recorded as follows. He was seen by Flying Officer Bruce, Flying Yellow 2, to pull up and only after he was attacked and whilst in the climb to slump forward and stall his machine into the ground. However, there was no time to mourn this long-serving friend and brother pilot. B-Flight mounted another patrol that afternoon from Vitry. During one fight, Pilot Officer Walker downed an HE-111, which forced landed with both its engines knocked out. It was reported in the RRB that its crew was then murdered by local French peasants. It was certainly a desperate fight for all those involved. B Flight, led by Flight Lieutenant Powell, and which included Flying Officer Ferris, was operating from Lille Mark, alongside elements from No. 17 and 253 Squadron. While escorting a bomber formation, the mission turned into a bit of a shambles. The escort leader evidently got himself lost and started to formate on Flight Lieutenant Powell, who was flying as Red 1. This led to the entire fighter escort circling around the sky until Powell dived low to ascertain their position. They were then over Duye. Minutes later, a formation of ME-110s was sighted flying west, about 4 miles from Duye and at 8,000 feet. The British fighters carved into them. Later returning to Lille, Flying Officer Ferris put in a claim for two ME-110s destroyed and a further two damaged. He had delivered several devastating attacks on these Germans, expending all his ammunition in the fight. Alarmingly though, during his return to the French airfield, Ferris had been attacked by more ME-110s. Defenceless, he had driven them off with a series of faint attacks before managing to land safely. Ferris would be in action again the next day where he claimed another damaged 110 over Lille. However, the 19th of May may have been his last had it not been for his excellent flying ability. Taking off, Flying Officer Ferris realised his engine was running very rough and could not use more than two pounds of boost without experiencing extreme vibrations. Thus handicapped, he entered the fight and was attacked by several 110s from head-on and to the beam. He opened fire himself, saw his own bullets hit the enemy just as he was hit in the wing by cannon fire. He limped back to base and was attacked as he did so. Nevertheless, it's interesting to know that he flew this damaged aircraft, L-1822, back across the channel to Northolt. The next day, he was in L-2001, flying back to the fight while his former mount was evidently repaired and put back on operations a few days later. These patrols over the Picardy front continued into the squadron move to Digby in Lincolnshire for 10 days of regrouping, re-equipping and training of replacements. On the 31st of May, flying from North Weald, number 111 squadron conducted a patrol over the Dunkirk beaches where it met heavy resistance. The day consisted of two patrols, with the squadron flying first to Hawkinge to refuel, then onto the French coast. During the evening patrol, following a return to Hawkinge for fuel, the squadron engaged with a large formation of HE-111s and ME-109s. That day, Triple One Squadron had been flying high top cover for other squadrons detailed to target bombers. It was reported that this seemed very effective, as it discouraged escorting 109s from diving on their lower British fighters for fear of being bounced by number 111 squadron. Nevertheless, it also appears that Flying Officer Ferris and other Hurricane pilots were just as likely to be fired on by Spitfires than Messerschmitts during this fight. On that day, number 111 claimed seven enemy aircraft, definitely downed, and three probables. Flying Officer Ferris claimed an ME-109 destroyed. This successful mission was followed by another patrol over Dunkirk on the 2nd of June, which was almost an encore to that of the 31st of May. Meeting the enemy towards the end of their endurance, number 111 claimed several enemy aircraft downed. Flying Officer Ferris alone claimed one ME-109 as destroyed and another as a probable.
On the 6th of June, Triple One was escorting a formation of Blenheims when they came across 17 109s over Abbeville. In fact, number 111 was again flying as protective cover, and their true role was to keep fighters off number 17 squadron, who were themselves detailed with the protection of the Blenheims. A pair of ME 109s were seen to move towards the British bombers, and as no fighters from number 17 squadron seemed to move to intercept them, Flight Lieutenant Powell sent the yellow section, led by Flying Officer Ferris, down after them. During the combat that ensued, Ferris managed to shoot the two 109s down, one of which that got on the tail of his number two, Pilot Officer B. Fisher. After what could have been said to be a rather successful mission, the squadron was then attacked by accurate AA fire from a British cruiser as it recrossed the channel for home. Over the next three days, with the German advance continuing, the squadron began patrolling the Littrepot area and inland as far as Omal, Honol le bord and Poix. Again, they were operating from Hawkinge as a forward airbase before moving down to Tangmere on the 9th of June. It was on the 10th of June 1940 that news of Flying Officer Ferris's DFC came through. That very same day, Ferris claimed one 109 destroyed off the coast of Folkestone and shared in the destruction of a Dornier 17. It's noted in the ORB that up to this date, he had downed at least seven aircraft, making him the top scoring pilot of the squadron. Patrols over the increasingly overwhelmed 51st Highland Division, now fighting in Normandy, continued until the 15th of June over the saint valery en cole area. After a few days of no operational flying, the squadron carried out a recon over Cherbourg on the 18th of June and then escorted skewer rock dive bombers while they attacked gun emplacements over Calais two days later. With the Battle of France officially coming to an end on the 25th, number 111 squadron received a note of congratulations for the part it played in providing air cover for the evacuation from La Havre and saint valery A further patrol over La Havre on the 27th resulted in no enemy action. And to finish out the month of fighting, on the 30th of June, number 111 was back over French soil, escorting a formation of Blenheims on a raid to Merville. The first week of July saw no operational flying for the squadron, but from the 8th, number 111 squadron was on convoy patrol duty. Following the 10th of July, the official beginning of the Battle of Britain, the squadron utilised Hawkinge as a forward base, from where it was scrambled almost every day that month. These sudden calls to action were punctuated by dawn, dusk and other patrols during the day. On that first official day of the battle, Flying Officer Ferris was almost shot down again. This took place during a combat that has ever been associated with one of the best propaganda photos of the war. Just so you know, this isn't the moment when Flying Officer Higgs, who really did lose his life, collided with a Dornier 215. It's a fake. Flying Officer Ferris had just managed to shoot a ME 109 into the sea when he was set upon by three of his comrades. They shot away one of his ailerons and then persisted in their attempts to shoot him down, following the young pilot for 20 miles. Ferris only managed to get back to base by carrying out gentle turns, which he suddenly steepened every time he saw the German traces pass by his cockpit, matching his turn to avoid their course. Eventually, the 109s got bored and pushed off to find some other victim. Over the following week, number 111 routinely set out for Hawkinge at dawn where it would mount patrols or scramble to intercept raids when instructed. For Flying Officer Ferris, nothing of note occurred until the 14th of July when he made a broadcast on the BBC and he is seemingly released from service until the 21st of July with what was to happen to him soon after. I hope that he made it back to Petswood Road in Alpington to see his mum and dad one last time. Flying Officer Ferris was back in action on the 25th of July, where his formation intercepted 17 enemy fighters off Dover. Pilot Officer Wilson claimed a 109 destroyed, and he and four other pilots claimed a further four damaged. Flying Officer Ferris would make another claim of his own three days later. During a patrol over Maidstone on the 28th of July, Ferris was leading a flight on a scramble, which was then directed out into the channel. Here, they found a pair of HE-59s, which were both claimed destroyed, shared by four of the six pilots present. The final entry for the month of July states the following. Destroyed, 57 enemy aircraft confirmed, one unconfirmed, 19 damaged. Our losses, four pilots and machines, 
six machines, one pilot wounded in the leg, one injured, bailing out. John Foreman, by this date, puts number 111's claims at 43 destroyed, 9 probable and 10 damaged. Norman Franks confirms their losses as 4 dead, 2 injured and 3 machines lost to action, with pilots safe. For number 111 squadron, the battle had hardly even begun. The beginning of August saw number 111 squadron carrying out patrols and scrambles from its now familiar forward base at Hawkinge, almost daily. But no enemy were intercepted until the 11th, when Flight Lieutenant Connors claimed a 109 destroyed near Margate, and Squadron Leader Thompson damaged a Dornier 17 east of North Foreland. This was also the day when Triple One Squadron suffered its worst losses yet, with four pilots being killed and another shot down but saved by his parachute. It's during this action that the ORB first mentions a method of attack that would become synonymous with Number 111 Squadron. Confronted with 15 plus Dornier 17s flying in close formation, Squadron Leader Thompson had organised his fighters in line astern and attacked the German bombers from below and astern. This attack was pushed home to within 100 yards, but the Hurricanes received heavy defensive fire from the German gunners. But following the attack in, a 109 picked off pilot officer McKenzie from behind. Okay, so let's consider a German bomber and how you would attack it. So obviously the most dangerous approach is from the stern um, and, and below, above, it doesn't really make much difference with these designs. Beam attacks were more desirable, but they're much harder to pull off. And as you're pulling away, you're gonna be exposed to the, the gunners uh, from the rear, especially if we're talking about formations of German bombers. So clearly the most effective way to bring down a bomber is from the front, a head-on attack. But of course, um, this is very dangerous with the closing speeds and the risk of collision, but there's less armament in the nose and less armor, so it's easier to kill or wound that crew and knock out the bomber. But even if you don't hit anything, by flying head on to them, you're easily going to break up the formation, which then allows other fighters to pick off the stragglers and break up that formation and shoot them down. This is clearly what number 111 squadron figured out and what they started experimenting with early in August 1940. Leading A flight, Flying Officer Ferris attempted to deliver a head-on attack, but was unable to get in position. Instead, beam attacks were carried out before the fight broke up. Despite his failure, it was clear that among the senior pilots of Triple One Squadron, the realization that German formations needed to be broken up was fully realized, and that the head-on approach was seen as the most effective method to do that. The next day, this theory was proved beyond a doubt. Attacking two formations of about 10 Dorniers over the Thames estuary, successful head-on attacks were carried out. Flying Officer Ferris personally claimed a Dornier 215 destroyed, and another four were claimed destroyed by the squadron, with a further three claimed damaged. This was added to later in the day by Sergeant Diamond, who claimed another Dornier 215 destroyed and one damaged. During this combat in particular, the squadron saw that a series of head-on and beam attacks were the most successful in causing maximum damage to the enemy while exposing your own men to the least danger. On the 14th of August, Mike Ferris was promoted to Flight Lieutenant, and the next day, Triple One was plunged into one of the biggest fights that it had had so far during the war. Scrambled just before 1500 hours, Number 111 met a large formation of enemy aircraft over Beachy Head. Again, a head-on attack was mounted by all Hurricanes involved. During the engagement, they claimed seven Dorniers destroyed and three damaged, with Flight Lieutenant Ferris claiming a probable himself. Just after 1700 hours, the squadron was scrambled again and claimed four BF-110s destroyed, four damaged and a probable 109. Another scramble around 1850 saw a further action which resulted in six aircraft claimed destroyed and a further three damaged. Number 111 had suffered two losses, one pilot flying officer B. Fisher being killed and another hurricane heavily damaged. It was also the same day that Flying Officer Higgs, who had been killed on the 10th of July, washed up on the Dutch coast, having drowned following his bailout. He is buried at Norvik in Holland. On the 16th of August 1940, having already flown to Hawkinge and carried out a patrol earlier that morning, the squadron was scrambled just before midday to intercept what was a formation of 200 Dornier 17s and ME 109s. 
Naturally, number 111 Squadron employed their now signature attack and took the entire formation head on. Squadron leader Thompson, leading Blue Section, immediately sent the Dornier down in flames, and Sergeant Craig, Red 2, got another. Red 3 was a newly arrived Canadian on his first combat mission. Somehow he survived it. He flew through the formation, but without seeing the effects of his fire. Flight Lieutenant Ferris, just 22 years old and leading Red Section in a manoeuvre he no doubt helped introduce, ploughed headlong into a Dornier. Both aircraft were seen to explode and fall to earth near Marden. The next day, number 111 was scrambled again. Now this video is dedicated to Mike, who lies in this rather neglected corner of a churchyard in Chislehurst. So please give the video a like to help spread his story to more people. And if you've enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments and I will definitely do some more.